And this morning, we had another chance for reflection on the Dharma. And so you've seen during this past week, I had a chance to reflect on the, say, the ordinary and the mundane and the, uh, all the worldly Dhammas uh, of greed, hatred and delusion as well as reflect on the grand kind of visions that have been presented to the mind uh, through the talks. And so this is uh, important for you to consider how to use the the, uh, conditions we find ourselves with. Like yesterday I I talked on devotional practice and didn't get really very far into it (laughs) but uh, the practice of metta as a way of of, uh, learning to be mindful of the unpleasant the that which we find ugly and repulsive uh, that we experience through the mind the senses (coughs) another practice that is very much a part of the Theravadan tradition is the, uh, what, the, what we call the sharing of merit. And this uh, is greatly misunderstood by Western people because the idea, the word merit itself somehow is not a very inspiring word. When you think of girl guides and boy scouts and the brownies. <coughs> but in, in Thailand or in Buddhist countries, uh, merit is something that is greatly sought after and uh, considered uh, something uh, quite worth pursuing is to do good actions for the for gaining merit or for what we mean by this is by doing that which is good <coughs> in the in the world uh, not for one thing because it if you if you've contemplated karma you see that to do good you receive good do bad you receive bad but also for the <coughs> welfare of all sentient beings so in the act of sharing of merit it's a skillful means which Buddhists use uh, in order to let go of the idea of one gaining through meritorious action. In other words, uh, one does a good action uh, and any merit or grace or goodness or good result or reward or happiness or joy or anything positive that is that one receives from this good action is to be shared uh, and given back for the welfare of all sentient beings. Now this this conceptual way of, of talking is a way of, of letting go of the idea of accumulating uh, merit for oneself in a, in a selfish way. The, uh, the attitude of doing good for the welfare of others rather than for personal gain. Because the tendency, even in Thailand, is sometimes to think of that you yourself are accumulating great storehouses of, of merit by doing this, and by even sharing the merit with with other beings you're somehow gaining more merit by sharing (laughs) (laughs) now and now this is uh, this is an act of devotion uh, which comes becomes quite significant in your life when you when you realize that you personally you as an individual your body and your mind has its profound effect on the universe where we tend to think of ourselves and think what I do it doesn't matter I can do what I want it's none of your business uh, and uh, if I do evil things it's my business not your business and I'm and uh, if I'm not hurting you why should you care uh, this this tendency in the West to be very strongly identified to a sense of being a unique and individual that has no connection with anything else and somehow is outside uh, the whole 
and so what I do is my own business, not yours. And this uh, this has reached uh, in the West, I think, its peak of of selfish uh, development in the recent years, to where uh, our identities are so limited to this body and our desires that we have we sometimes very very insensitive and irresponsible uh, to the people we're living with and the society that we're in and to the world because you think none of your business I mean, we think of our parents we think our mothers fathers say that's not a very nice thing if you've done something very insensitive and cruel to your mother and father and you say shut up it's none of your business <laughs> my life <laughs> I can do what I want I'm over 21 <laughs> how dare you interfere with my life trying to possess hold on keep the strings and so forth and we think it's my life and I can do what I want with it <clears throat> well say in uh, uh, a previous time in the west or as many Asian countries now the tendency to identification uh, is tends to be broader rather than so specifically uh, directed towards one's one's own body. Like in Thailand, uh, Thai people tend to identify more with a family unit than with a stronger identity and sense of of uh, being a person is very much a part of a family, where. Uh, I can see in my own life, I'm speaking from my own experience, uh, uh, is that one's identity with a family is very little nowadays, at least in my life. I don't feel any great strong identity with my parents, or with, uh, with a class, or with even a nation. These things are very weak uh, in, in my mind, they're not, they're not very strong. And the, so therefore, the, the identification tends to be very strong with the individual self, with me, with this body, and the abilities and inabilities, my strengths and weaknesses, which tend to cause an increasing amount uh, of anguish and despair. As you grow older, you become, you feel so isolated and alone, and so unable to communicate or understand or have communion with another being because your conditioning is one of which you you tend to cut off and separate and live uh, in your own world which doesn't include anyone else really so in the sharing of merit say we begin to understand that what we do how we live has its profound effect on the on the universe we live in. Now this was uh, quite an awakening for myself because uh, before I had very much of this sense of none of your business, I can do what I want. And then through, say, meditation and beginning to understand what the universe really is, I began to see that I had to be responsible for how I lived because not being a mean and nasty and evil person by nature, I never have really wanted to be responsible for causing unnecessary misery and suffering to other beings. And I could see that uh, if I lived foolishly and stupidly and selfishly, that this has its effect uh, on the universe, on the on the people I live with, on the on the society I'm in, and on the country and on the world and so all sentient beings suffer because of my stupidity and selfishness now I reflect on this in the monastery we reflect on this every morning and uh, the attitude of sharing our, the merit of our lives uh, living our lives <clears throat> during the day in a way that is trying to be as skillful and as sensitive as possible uh, any <clears throat> uh, our actions to be done not for, uh, say, uh, our own desire to be enlightened, 
but for the welfare and concern for all sentient beings. When people ask me, what, how, what are you doing for the third world? Say, I share my merit with, with all beings in the third world, second and first. <laughs> Making no preferences. And when we think, if we reflect that if we live foolishly and stupidly, we're adding that much more momentum and power to all that is heedless and stupid and foolish in the world. And there's already so much of that. Anyway, we don't need to feel obligated to add to that. What is, uh, seems to be a lack, particularly now, is concentrated effort in doing good and living mindfully. So, and then the merit, any merit to be shared, to do this not for one's own sake, but for the welfare of all sentient beings. And in the practice of sharing of merit, we, we, we reflect on, it's like a, a Buddhist way of praying for somebody, like somebody's ill. Christians will come and they'll say, my, my wife has cancer and she, She's not expected to live much longer. Do you Buddhists pray? And I say, oh yes, we do. And uh, she said, well, will you pray for my wife? And so I, we, we, uh, we uh, say in our morning chanting in that, the merit of our lives, uh, any grace or goodness that we might gain is to be shared. Or good actions done, particularly for, say, and the, and the merit of that good action to be shared with that particular person who's ill. So, in, in Buddhist countries, like, people will come and they'll say, uh, with, uh, they'll give a dana, they'll give food to the monks, and they'll say, with the, can this merit be shared with uh, so-and-so who's ill, or with some, with parents who have departed, or whoever one wants to share it with, so you particularly, say, specify the name of that person uh, and then add and all sentient beings. So that uh, even though your, your, this particular, say, food might be offered for the welfare of, uh, and, and growth and enlightenment of, of one's mother, uh, it's not only for one's mother, but for all sentient beings. So this is, this is the Buddhist way of, ex, of developing the, the devotional side of religious practice. It's uh, an expanding of the heart in, in, in this way to include all, uh, without preference, without uh, 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 distinction, uh, from the, the finest, say, to the, to one's, uh, say, the, the monk, say, to the upachaya, the preceptor that ordained us, to all the teachers who have taught us, to parents and husband, wife, brothers, sisters, uh, good friends, uh, the, the king and queen, the rulers of the country. We, we share our merit every day at Chithurst with the, uh, the, the Prime Minister, the members of Parliament. <laughs> with, with all, uh, say, all the animal realms, all the animal world, and all those uh, uh, in various stages of anguish and despair, such as uh, criminals and, and, um, people locked away in mental institutions, all those who are sick and weak or drug addicts and so forth, down to the most malevolent and brutal beings that exist in the world, the merit offered equally to all sentient beings. In this way you, you, uh, you begin to include within your heart, in a, in a very conscious way, all possibilities of of existence of sentient beings that could possibly exist from the highest like the deva kind of ethereal refined 
beings to the coarsest and most evil and all gradations in between. Now this act of devotion is is uh, is a way of of developing the heart. When you say it's a, it's not a this is not to be a rational, sensible kind of thing in which you have to uh, be guaranteed that you give so much food, you'll get so much uh, so much of a reward, or to see vivid evidence that your meritorious life has really had its profound effect on the third world, or that uh, you know offering merit every day for criminals in prisons and drug a- drug addicts is really solving their problems. This is not a rational kind of thing where you're you're weighing on a scale uh, the amount of goodness you're doing by the effects that you can see with the eye or hear with the ear. It's an act of faith, and so this devotion is is faith, is, and faith is action in the world. It's how we live and relate within the human form to the other human. Uh, or sentient beings that surround us and that we uh, are part of and, uh, and this is what we mean by devotion now we find with in Buddhism itself and in Britain a sense of not understanding the, the value of devotional practice because it's connected with kind of blind faith you know, kind of smarmy sweet sentiments that uh, seem uh, that only foolish people tend to to reiterate and if we consider ourselves one who doesn't fall for all those silly kind of sentimental things we tend to feel an aversion arising in our mind uh, toward uh, devotional practices uh, like bowing or lighting of candles and incense chanting offering of merit, uh, spreading metta, uh, and all this kind of, of thing, we can, we can all lump together and say superstition or uh, foolishness. I want the pure teaching of the Dharma, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and give me a practical kind of meditation practice that makes sense and that I can accept and then I'll do it. But I don't want any of that other stuff. <laughs> now in practice of meditation you you say that like the compassion and joy um now these arise, these are developed in one's life as we tend to, say, learn to give out rather than to take. Uh, so many, so much of the time, you people are saying, what did you get out of that meditation retreat? Uh, when, when you heard his talk, did you get anything from it? Uh, did you went to this Buddhist center somewhere, did you, what did you get out of it? Now, this sense of, what, what are we getting from all this? What this Buddhist society, some of it, what are we getting out of it? <laughs> okay. This is this is the this attitude is the is the attitude of one who still uh, does not understand karma or rebirth, and who still goes at things with the idea of getting something. And so, when we change that to say giving rather than than taking like when we went when we come here to the Buddhist society summer school what are we giving to it can we give anything can what how can we help it how can we give to it rather than what am I getting out of it you see now this now this attitude of giving is uh, takes a lot of humility and patience and yet this very attitude is the attitude which uh, is the path to enlightenment. What, what can I give? How can I help? Uh, and if we can just give ourselves to the summer school, to, to be one who's content with 
with uh, the things as they are rather than than complaining about this or that uh, reflecting on what's being said without demanding that that things be said that we agree with but being able to to accept even that those things that baffle us or that we don't agree with with a patient uh, patience and humility uh, being grateful for the things offered for the talks given rather than being critical uh, and saying oh I didn't like that no I don't agree with that <laughs> that is attitude of, of feeling gratitude for, for people who have taken the time to come in and offer some kind of experience or knowledge or information or help that, that they uh, have, have experienced or that they can give us and then we accept with gratitude and say thank you very much whether we agree or not whether it's been absolutely fantastic or very minimal we don't care anymore we're not concerned about the amount or how much we get even if we get just a little bit or even if nothing we'll be grateful for that because then you're approaching more what uh, uh, was talked about last evening <laughs> so this uh, say compassion and joy uh, uh, karuna mudita and upeka, we've already discussed metta. Metta is, uh, upeka is the uh, equanimity. And this is, uh, say, being able to remain balanced in, in oneself, no matter what life presents to us. In other words, if we are lacking in upeka in our lives, we tend to be carried away all the time by the qualities we're experiencing through the senses. If you have no upeka at all, somebody says to you, you're absolutely wonderful, you're divine, and you jump for joy, hooray! <laughs> you get very high. That's a really wonderfully sensitive person. <laughs> Then someone else comes along and says, you're so stupid and disgusting. <laughs> and you become terribly depressed. You want to kill yourself or kill the person. <laughs> and this is a lack, genuine lack of equanimity. In other words, what other people say has, uh, seems to overwhelm you. If it's positive and good, you, you, you're very happy. If it's insulting and and unpleasant you'll become depressed same applies to say good fortune and bad fortune you inherit a million pounds you jump for joy and you lose a million pounds and you start thinking of ways of killing yourself no upeka no, no equanimity uh, you succeed or you fail you become a great worldly success acclaimed the greatest human being since since somebody <laughs> <laughs> and you feel joyful and happy and wonderful and then you're humiliated and despised by the world and you feel depressed no upeka no equanimity so in developing equanimity it's in seeing the equal value of both praise and blame success and failure good fortune and bad fortune these are happiness and suffering by seeing that both praise and blame they come and they go they change uh, one feels good one doesn't but you begin to see that it's not so you begin to say examine the the reactions you have the impulses you have in your own mind like uh, in your lives your daily lives if you start looking at your own mind rather than trying to say 
transform yourself into the ideal or feeling that you more or less have been given a bad kind of deal in life and you have to more or less just live in, in, a, in a miserable state of what you think you are, you begin to penetrate the very feelings of happiness and suffering, success and failure, uh, good fortune and bad fortune, praise and blame. And you see that even depression, even though it has an eternal appearance of eternality, is only a moment in time. Same with happiness. In the meditation, wisdom arises through this kind of investigation, which is not a judgmental investigation, such as an analyzing the conditions by saying one kind of happiness is better than another, or you're not trying to figure yourself out according to uh, theories uh, that you have about uh, what you should be or shouldn't be, but you just observe, be content with the moment as it is, meaning whatever it is, you're aware of it as, as it is, and see how long it lasts. Be one who has courage to investigate things, even the most unpleasant and painful situations are filled with every possibility for enlightenment if you, will, if you make the effort to do so. So in wisdom, you see, wisdom is, is where there is no thing. And in compassion, we have compassion for everything. So in these two seemingly opposed uh, things, where everything and nothing, uh, we find our balance because we're not making preferences anymore. We're not seeking annihilation or uh, an idea of emptiness as a place that we should be identified with, nor are we seeking our identity among all the myriad manifestations that we experience through the mind. But we begin to be at peace with the arising and passing of conditions and with the emptiness. In other words, there's no attachment to either extreme no uh, effort to identify with greed, hatred and delusion nor with no greed, hatred and delusion. So in this practice uh, of, of meditation uh, the Buddha was, uh, I think people it's very hard for, for Western people to realize that the Buddha was not in any way philosophizing about the nature of existence or theorizing or uh, creating any doctrines about the nature of things but pointing a way only that uh, is very practical uh, it's not a denial nor an affirmation but a pointer and so therefore when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, Three Characteristics of Existence, so forth, we're not saying you, to be a Buddhist you have to believe in anatta, or you have to believe in karma and rebirth, or you have to believe in the Buddha. It's not a matter of belief at all. It's not saying to believe or disbelieve, but to find out to, through your own direct experience of it. In, uh, say, in the Theravada tradition, the, it's a, a very simple kind of, of uh, Buddhist uh, teaching. It, uh, nothing much is, is taught other than, than the, the Four Noble Truths and the Full Path. And then, people tend to criticize Theravadans for, because they, they have these ideas about there's something more than that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that you, 
you start thinking, well, you know, you you, uh, you want something like one would like to read Shakespeare, rather than start learning the ABCs. See, it's uh, if you think I would, there's Hamlet and Macbeth, and that's much more interesting than than A B C D E F G. But you can't very well start out. Uh, unless you have incredible biometers from previous lives, <laughs> <laughs> reading uh, Hamlet, we have to start out with a simple A, B, C, D. Now, once you learn the basic skills, what you do with them is up to you, isn't it? Once you learn how to read, and this is a book, I am a man, you can uh, find out, you can begin to uh, uh, read more complicated literature than that. But that's up to you, what, how, much, how far you want to go, what you want to do with it. So, let's say, in, in teaching uh, meditation, it's just a mer- way of teaching basic skills, uh, developing some skill in a way of seeing things clearly. And then the rest becomes quite clear. And you talk about shunyata or things of that nature. That becomes quite obviously real. If you, uh, uh, if you already uh, have penetrated the fact that uh, the things that we think, feel, see, experience through the senses are not self are just the impermanent conditions arising and passing. All that begins ends, all that arises passes away. And as I've said once before, in the, in the very first sutta, uh, the Dhammajaka sutta, uh, that the Buddha gave in, in the deer park in Benares to the five disciples, was just this basic exposition of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Then at the end of it, the, the, the disciple Kandanya understands. And the Buddha praises him. He says, oh, Kandanya understands. He's, he's the, he knows, Anya Kandanya. And what does Kandanya understand? That all that arises passes away. <laughs> so this is why in our practice, uh, rather than trying to have the godlike vision from the heavenly realms, the <coughs> celestial view, and understand everything in all its complexity, we content ourselves with understanding the mundane, the ordinary, and penetrating the ordinary, just like the breath, the inhalation, the exhalation, just walking, sitting, standing, lying down just the most ordinary conditions of our daily lives. Uh, there's the Dhamma, the profound Dhamma in all these uh, actions that we <coughs> experience in, in our lives to be enlightened with. If you're trying to seek to understand on the grand, on the grand view, it would be terribly difficult. Because that's not the lesson we are to, that's not our, uh, that's not what we need to do in this lifetime as human beings. Because we can only understand the grand, we're understanding the most humble, the most ordinary. So that's why meditation is always here and now, with whatever is, as it is, no matter what its quality might be, high or low, good or bad. And, the act of giving out rather than of getting. How much can we give? Uh, let's make our lives one of giving rather than of taking. Because in this outward giving, in that very motion of going out like this, is an act of opening. It's like your body is opening up, isn't it? Where get, grasping or taking is, is closing off, shutting ourselves off. The act of giving, just like opening the palms, giving out, is, is physically it's even an opening out to others. Uh, could you have a 
Would it be possible to say a little more about the cultivation of the big heart? <laughs> Like, like the in the Barami, in the Theravada school, there, there are ten Baramitas. The last two listed are Metta and Upeka, and those are also the the first and the last of the Brahma Viharas, you know, if you've noticed. The two uh, Karuna and Mudita are not considered Baramitas, because these Baramitas are perfections that one develops and therefore karuna mudita tend to arise quite spontaneously when uh, when there is mindfulness <coughs> when there is uh, when, the, when the other barometers have been established in one's life now upeka is is uh, people tend to translate that as kind of indifference or uh, or equanimity sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll use the word indifference which means not being concerned with anything so many people feel upeka is just kind of shutting oneself off and saying and as you see some maniac comes into this room and starts slashing away at everybody I just say in permanent condition, not so. <laughs> uh, I'd become kind of monster myself, wouldn't I? Uh, not being totally indifferent to what's going on. But the the uh, upeka is is that in in ourselves? Say of way of not being overwhelmed by the qualities uh, of success or failure good fortune or bad fortune uh, happiness or suffering uh, praise or blame that we experience now that doesn't mean we're indifferent in a sense of insensitive to praise and blame you're not, you're not just, say, repressing any, any kind of feeling that arises and saying, oh, I shouldn't feel happy if I'm praised and I shouldn't feel depressed if I'm uh, criticized. It's not that, because then you, one tends to repress and, and ignore or uh, look away from. But by upeka means to maintain a cool, calm, centeredness uh, 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 toward praise and blame so that we can be aware of, of the habits we already have like it's natural and I personally from speaking from my own uh, knowledge of my own character is that when somebody says you're absolutely wonderful I like that and <laughs> 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 um, when somebody says you're rotten and disgusting I don't like to hear that either now it's, it's not that I should like to hear the true the, the true facts of existence that I'm rotten and disgusting <laughs> and that I should despise hearing the untrue fact that I'm absolutely wonderful it's not, it's not playing games with your mind at all uh, that, but it's awareness of, of the feelings of liking and disliking that arise and knowing them just as they are knowing feeling is feeling and in that you be, become equanimous with it you can accept praise and listen to blame uh, without repression or indulgence so because sometimes in praise there's a lot of truth sometimes we are absolutely wonderful all of us and at other times we're absolutely rotten and sometimes people are just being nasty they're just saying you're absolutely rotten because they're angry with you and they want to hurt you and sometimes people are being obsequious uh, uh, trying to get something from us by saying you're absolutely wonderful but we can listen you know and, and in that in that awareness 
is, is the ability to respond appropriately because we've not been we're not uh, blaming others we're not uh, reacting to what's being said in a, in a foolish and heedless way so in uh, Ajahn Chah he was always uh, his, one of his great uh, points of stress stressing uh, uh, in teaching when he was in England last year was see all conditions of equal value <coughs> success or failure now say like like um, we all like to feel that we're, what we're doing is successful I mean, they, it was a successful summer school oh yeah and then somebody says, it was a failure. It was really the worst summer school I've ever seen. And they feel, oh, I don't think I'll even go next year. <laughs> you see, we're reacting. But when we hear, you know, what it was a really successful summer school, we can accept that without trying to deny it. Because we, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's a matter of opinion. Or if it is the most miserable one uh, that one's ever been to that's a matter of opinion but one can can accept and learn from from both success and failure from good fortune and bad fortune good health and bad health from uh, whatever conditions we experience in our lives we see they all take us to the same place to the end of the deathless these are if you if if there's a in in the sutras they say what is the essence of all condition the Buddha said deliverance is their essence so all conditions no matter what those conditions might be good or bad if you're aware of them take you uh, deliver you from delusion and where do all conditions merge into the deathless so, in, when we uh, are patient and humble and uh, equanimous, then we can be we can allow everything to to teach us uh, and uh, merge in the into the deathless. Does that answer your question?